You're watching the New Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. Hey, all. Hey, second episode where we're going video first. And so if you're watching this, then you can, you know, if you're listening, if you're listening to this, you should go to the our YouTube page on the new stack and I'll provide the show notes and everything else in there so you can take a look. But it's kind of, we're just trying a little bit something different. And today we're talking about developer happiness. Yay. Yay. And uh, we're going to start off with a little clip. And so if you are, if you are uh, watching, uh, if you're watching this, great. But if you're at home listening to this, you may want to check this out because who doesn't love the film Office Space? But first, before we get to our little Office Space clip, I want to introduce Joan Westenberg, who is my co-host today. Hey, Joan. Hey, it's good to be here. i um, excited to be, I guess, checking in from Sydney, Australia. So if you, if, you, if you love the accent, if you hate the accent, I can't help you there. You just got to live with it. <laughs> Why does it say pepper jam when there is no pepper jam? I swear to God, one of these days, I, I, I just kick this piece of shit out the window. You and me both, man. The thing is lucky I'm not armed. Piece of shit. PC load letter? What the fuck does that mean? I love it. So I'm going to just show everyone Joan's blog. She, uh, Joan is a, um, a writer. Joan is a technologist. Joan, I think you told me when we first were chatting, like how you got started in, in, in computers. What, what was the, what's the, what's the backstory on that? Yeah. So look, my, um, my trigger point for really getting deep into computers was Wolfenstein 3D. So it would have been like 2001, 2002. I started learning how to code because I wanted to make my own mods for Wolfenstein 3D. And there wasn't much of a, a, a tool set available back then. All you, all you could do was just sit down, go through the source code, make your modifications, recompile, and all that kind of stuff. So I got I got books from the library. I taught myself how to code, and I joined that dev community, and I, I started pumping out mods. And it was an awesome time to be online. And this was pretty much before social media became a thing. We all connected on forums like the Wolfenstein 3D Dome. And I had this love for tech and for development and for building products. Um, parallel to that, I've, I've always been a writer. I've always loved telling stories. So I guess I've had these kind of two careers where on the one hand, I have loved and been involved with technology, with building things. And on the other hand, I write about it. And the writing is the part that I'm most passionate about because I think that telling the, the stories of tech and explaining it to a wider audience, to the general public, that is a very important thing that we sometimes forget to do. So that's my background. That's how I came to be here. But before I get started, um... I wanted to just give kind of a preamble a little bit on what we were thinking about doing today. And I asked Joan, I said, Joan, what would we be interested in? And like we talked about this overloading of tools that developers now have at their disposal. They're just everywhere. And it becomes, I think, a challenge for, I know as a writer, it becomes a challenge just thinking how you use all the different kinds of tools that are available out there. And I don't see that great a difference sometimes between coding and writing. Now, I've only coded the tiniest little bits in my day. Um, but you can get a sense of like, you're, you know, you're writing, you're, you're telling a story, you're expressing yourself. And one of the things that I've noticed is how expressive developers have, have really gotten over the past 10 to 15 years. But now we face this new emergence of generative AI. And there's lots of thinking about what actually you can do with AI or what you can't do. And so I thought that would be a good starting point for us to discuss. And I know, Joan, you've been playing around with, uh, with Copilot and you were going to show us a little bit. But before we get there, I'm just curious on your kind of your, your thoughts on the state of things right now. Yeah, I mean, I like what you said there about writing code being similar to writing, and it's 100% true. You know, we call them, 
we call them languages. You know, when we're coding, we talk about languages, we talk about writing. It is the same kind of thing. We are expressing an idea, we are expressing a concept. And just like in, in code, the English language can have errors and bugs and people can misunderstand you and it can really gum up the works. So there are definitely similarities there. There are, there are ties that we can see. The state of things, yeah, it's been an interesting, I guess, 18 months, I would call it. The world has changed a lot. And I don't mean that in the in the sense that AI blowhards mean on LinkedIn where the world has changed every every week. It has been a shift, like a fundamental shift in how people think about writing and development and creative work, where suddenly it was no longer a path or a calling or something you dedicated yourself to. It was quote unquote democratized. You know, we see that word everywhere. It's become the buzzword, democratized. And you know, when I come to that word, when I come to that word as a writer, democratized means breaking down access to something that had been held by a select few. You know, you democratize wealth because it's been concentrated to like the one percent, that kind of thing. But in this new world of AI powered writing and AI powered development, democratization seems to mean making something available to everyone without them having to do the research or the work or the learning. And it's a very different meaning to the word, but I think it sums up where we've got to. this idea that there are uh, two kind of forms of creator and that creator can be a, you know, whether, whether we're talking about a filmmaker or a writer or, or a dev, there are two types. There's the ones who create things because they are sitting down and they're coding, they're writing a book, they're creating a video, or they're the ones that just want to make a prompt and just have something out there in front of them. And we seem to have divided ourselves into these two camps. And so I think I, I've reached this, this philosophical question where I'm asking, okay, if we can take a step back from is AI good or bad, what we need to ask is what's a dev? What is a writer now? What level of AI input makes someone not a dev or not a writer? Is there any level? Like, can you use AI and still be on par with somebody else? And so that's the really interesting question. That's where I've kind of landed and that's the state of things for me. Well, You've been using Copilot, so I'd love to see if you could share your screen and show us some of the things that you've been using Copilot for and what you've learned. Absolutely. So I've primarily been using um, Microsoft 365 Copilot of late, um, and that's just because it's it, it's kind of this catch-all where Microsoft want this one tool to bridge the gap between your work, no matter where your work is, and no matter what your work is. So there's obviously an extension of what Microsoft were trying to do with GitHub Copilot, and it's an extension of their work with ChatGPT. And what they've done here is they've created an entire tool set that is meant to draw data from your Microsoft 365 account, from the work that you do from your flow, and be able to sit with you and do that work with you, whether it's, whether it's your coding, whether it's writing presentations, whether it's writing documents. Um, and it's, it's kind of become the big thing that they are hanging their hat on um, of late. You know, you see every, every single announcement, every single thing that Microsoft talks about, AI is in there. AI is very much a part of this. I'm going to share my Copilot tab with you here. So this is Copilot for Microsoft 365. Um, this is a product they dropped um, pretty much just a month ago. So it's brand new. This is the one that they've been building up to for a long time. Um, when Microsoft first started getting into this AI toolset game, like I said, it was GitHub Copilot, and then it was Bing Chat, and now they've brought it all together in this product. So the basic interface is, I mean, it's not that dissimilar to something like ChatGPT, something like Claude AI, tools like that, but it has varying capabilities. So for example, I can say to it, you know, if I have um, my emails plugged into this or my calendar plugged into this, I can say, can you summarize my my meetings for the week, that kind of thing. Um, summarize Microsoft Teams meetings for the week. Now, in theory, when you do this, it should be able to look at all the times that you've used Microsoft Teams over here in a nice little tab or in the, the desktop app or whatever. It should be able to remember what those meetings were and if you've got it turned on during those meetings, what happened in them. Let's see what it does. It thinks, it thinks, it thinks, it looks. And then you have errors like this. I'm sorry, but I couldn't provide any information about your Microsoft Teams meetings for the week. And this is funny because I've been on four different Microsoft Meetings calls this morning. And what it's meant to do is, is plug that in. 
um, what Microsoft Teams meetings that I attend. Let's see what it comes up with. I need some kind of loading music when it's doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, and and then you, you come up with these with these same errors. It's meant to work because what is it, it saying just for people who are out? Teams. What is it saying? So it's saying, you? yeah, I'm sorry, but I couldn't find any information about the Microsoft Teams meetings you attended. Can you please provide more details or specify a date range for me to search? Mm -hmm. um, so then you can say, you know, um, <clears throat> March, February five, two thousand and twenty-four. Show me some of those meetings. Let's see what it does. Okay, I'll look for Microsoft Teams meetings on February 5, 2024. I'm sorry, but I couldn't find any information about it. And so you see, it, it is meant to plug into this stuff, but it's not reliable when it comes to actually giving you something. So let's try yeah, something else here. Yeah, let's try to create a Word document. It's thinking, it's thinking. Okay, I'll look for create a Word document. Coming through documents I found that might be relevant. And then it tells me how to create a blank Word document. Okay. Um, and so it says, I can help you create a Word document. You can create a new Word document by opening the Microsoft Word application and clicking on the blank document option. Okay. And so you, you just think, well, isn't that something that should be able to be done here? So let's ask it, what can you do? And then it's thinking. What's the latest from my manager organized by emails, messages, and files? Provide a detailed summary of my team's messages from this week. Summarize emails where I was mentioned recently. How do I write a request for proposal? Supposedly, you can reference documents by typing forward slash. Um, it's not bringing up documents since February 7th. Um, so you can see that there are, you know, and it's, it's found some meetings that I've had. It's found meetings that have already happened but it, it can't bring them up and summarize them when I ask about Teams meetings. So there's these huge limitations here. And I guess my point is not that Copilot is bad. It can do some very cool stuff. It can summarize, you know, when, it, when it does summarize your emails, it does it very well. My point is that with a lot of these tools, they can't reliably do these things when you want them to. Right. And for a, a developer, for someone who is, they're under the pump, they're time poor, they're trying to get some stuff done they can't use tools in their workflow that they can't rely on because that's just adding to their cognitive load and it's making things harder for them. They can think to themselves, oh yeah, this task will take shorter if this AI tool works. But if it doesn't work, if I go there and it doesn't work and I can't get it to do the task that it's meant to do, where does that leave me? And we've seen similar things with ChatGPT. You know, ChatGPT will say, can you, can you code a, a thing for me? And it will give you fragments of code, but it won't give you complete code and it will skip things. And sometimes it will just say to you, no, I can't help with that, but here's how you could code that yourself. So it's just that level of unreliability that means you can't count on it being there with you when you need it. And I think that's funny because we are talking here about something called Copilot. And so it's kind of like being Han Solo and turning to Chewbacca and saying, the TIE fighters are after us. We need to you know, raise the shields, jump to hyperspace. And Chewie's just like, I'm sorry, as a large language model, I can't help with that. <laughs> Have you tried fighting the TIE fighters yourself? You know, it's just, you can't count on it. So it's not a co-pilot. <laughs> that's the best. <laughs> so yeah, that's my, that's my experience. <laughs> yeah, that's what my experience about... with co-pilot and with a lot of these <clears throat> products. Have you tried it with coding at all? Look, I haven't gone deep into this one with coding. Um, I, I I have used GitHub Copilot to do a lot of that stuff in the past. Um, and it can be good depending on what you're doing. Um, it's good at picking things up. Um, I stopped paying for a GitHub Copilot subscription, mostly because I really didn't want to spend a whole lot of money on that because these AI tools add up. But I've done a fair bit of, I guess, coding in, um, in tools like ChatGPT as well. And there's definitely some stuff that you can you can struggle with there from time to time. Um, I'll open up a chat GPT screen. Yeah, let's look at it. Let's let's give it a go. Yeah, one second. Okay, so 
I've been running some tests on this just to see how it handles some pretty basic kind of code. So I was doing this specifically for this video. So what I've done here is I've taken a, a calculator widget that I've, I've been working on for some other folks. It's a very simple widget, it takes some data, um, takes some inputs, gives you an estimation for some, uh, some, basically some employee data, that kind of stuff. But what we've kind of wound up with is, okay, a request to optimize the code and output finished code. Um, it ignores the, the command of outputting finished code. Um, and what it does is it kind of, it starts off doing the code, it starts off doing the code right, and then it gets to this section of the code here, and it decides that it's bored with outputting finished code, and it just starts substituting add other things here, add product checkboxes here, product use checkbox. And, and so it started replacing the work that you want it to do with placeholders where it wants you to do the work later, which is something that you see more and more often. So if you want to, to actually do that full work yourself, you then got to put in another request output with all my content, finish production code. And then it, it does go through and it does fill in the rest of the work, but you do have to double check and double command it to do that because it has started defaulting to, I guess, almost a degree of laziness. And this is something that people have commented about before with ChatGPT, where it is, it is getting to a degree of laziness where it doesn't want to actually do anything <laughs> and it tries to stop it if it can. So that's one kind of area where you can see that in action. If you start up a new and you kind of chat, you can you can get some pretty useful stuff out of it by giving you commands like um, how do I code a widget calculator from scratch with six input variables. Um, and it's thinking it's creating a widget from scratch and then it's going to give you the steps to do that. So it's making an assumption here. Let's assume you want to develop a web-based calculator using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Step one, define the functionality. Uh, step two, design the user interface. This is all very basic stuff, you know, but we can stop that and we can say, okay, you're on the right direction. Draft the first version of the code. Okay, so for so simple things, uh, so so for simple things, you know, like creating a calculator from scratch, you can develop and generate the code for it. Mm. But, and I expect that, like, maybe like a you know an advanced programmer, someone who has a lot of experience, might be able to put some code in that they've generated and say, "Do you see anything that's interest that's." Uh, that any but do you see any bugs in this code for example for yeah example? in theory that should be what it what it can do and you know chat gpt so this is it generating the code so you can see it it's starting to put stuff together that would be basically usable you have to go through and, and put this stuff together but it's giving you the the fragments it gives but you the ChatGPT it gives you the little has, yeah yeah so you almost have to do it, does it in also chunks. Have, you do, yeah. R rather than saying code an app, you have to code it piece by piece and do it yourself. And the same thing is true with articles. You know, it, it can't really write a yeah. full article for you because it just turns into shit after one paragraph. So you've got to do it paragraph by paragraph. Um, but for coding, there's also custom GPTs. So there's some tools that can, you know, they call themselves the world's most powerful coding assistant, code interpreter, that kind of stuff. Mm. So you can plug one of these in. Um, technically uh, mm -hmm. and then it should it should do stuff for you so okay you can turn on python mode with this hello you're in python mode whether you're on a script debugging any advice or best practices i'm here to help um join our creative vip community that kind of stuff um so i want you to draft a piece of complex python sample code let's just see what it comes up with Okay, so let's draft a complex Python cycle code that develop, demonstrates multiple advanced concepts, um, such as object-oriented programming, file handling, and so on. The scenario for this code will be a data processing application that reads a CSV file and performs data manipulations. And so you can see it's starting to, to put, it's starting to output this content. So what I'm, what I'm going to do here is something a little bit interesting. Um, I'm going to wait for it to finish coding itself. 
and then we're going to get ChatGPT to check its own code in a different chat and see okay. what it does to itself. So we can take this code that's generated, let's get a new ChatGPT screen up. Let's um, rate this code. And you're pasting it in. Yep. Yeah. And what's it saying? So it says um, functionality, it rates its code 8 out of 10. Um, mm -hmm. The code implements a basic data processing pipeline. Um, it says it basically does a, an average job of that structure and readability. It gives itself 9 out of 10. Um, error handling, 7 out of 10. However, there are areas for improvement. The error handling could be more granular, especially in the right data method to distinguish between different types of exceptions, e.g. permission errors. Returning none in case of errors is a simple approach, but it might be better to raise exceptions in some cases to allow upstream code to handle these situations more flexible. So uh, there is definitely some good stuff in here when it's reviewing its own code. Um, and I don't want my negativity about AI that can sometimes bubble to the surface to take away from the fact that this is all very cool. You know, it's very cool that it can generate code, yeah. that it can check code, that it can tell you how to improve it. But I think it comes back to the problem I was talking about with regards to Copilot. It's that level of reliability here. And so I can't help feeling that we're going to wind up with two kind of, a, a, you know, I said before, we can have these two different kinds of programmers, the ones who program themselves and the ones who program just using these AI tools. And I think if you are only good enough that you can program with AI tools or write with AI tools, you probably can't tell whether or not something is good, bad, optimized, right. could be optimized better and, and that kind of stuff. So I think your code is probably going to sit at one level and it's not going to improve that much in the same way that if you are just using chat GPT to write your blog, you're not going to improve as a writer. But if you are getting your hands dirty with this code and you're actually coding and you're taking some of this output and you're using off and you're, you're fixing or finalizing it, you have the chance to grow and to increase your output. So that, that's probably my, my biggest take about this is anyone using AI is only going to be as successful with it as their own level of knowledge about their domain. So a good coder is going to have a better result from ChatGPT, from GitHub Copilot, from any kind of AI tool. And a good writer will have a different result from Claude AI. And somebody who isn't trained, isn't experienced, and doesn't know how to program something from scratch or write an essay from scratch, they're only going to be able to produce very basic, mid-level kind of work. That that would be my, my takeaway from all this. In the meantime, there's so many distractions that, that people face in their work, be it Zoom or Notion or having to, you know, work across different teams and managing email. And everything else and so you know for the person who is on deadline uh who has to get something done pretty quickly i expect there's an overload that happens and we're starting i'm starting to see it at least in in my work where you know i i might find like a workflow that 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 makes sense for me so maybe i'll record a, um an interview then I will take that transcript and I'll put it into Claude. You know, I'll start querying that interview and I'll look for all the, you know, the points that are salient. And then I'll start thinking maybe there's some, there, maybe there's a story here that I can to start to build out. But then <clears throat> you start realizing, wait, there's this new tools like perplexity, which kind of combines immediate search with the ability to, you know, use an LM in natural language processing all these tools now are starting to build out their own AI integrations, right? So we were looking at Zoom the other day, which has an AI capability, which is hard to make sense of really what it provides. <clears throat> so there was always this huge over overload already, and now AI is on top of that. And I'm curious- It's just making you know, it harder, you know? It's, um, like we have reached a point where we are just we're tool switching so much that it's an opportunity cost and it's a, an attention cost. You know, if, if I'm sitting here with you guys on this, on this video, and then I get off this video and I have to go and, and update a whole bunch of things in Notion, like that's great, but then there's some stuff over in Confluence and that's great. And then I have to talk to people on Teams and then Microsoft and, and Slack and all this, like it all just adds up. You know, you have this overload of tools 
and you have to remember which piece of information is where. And then you have all the tools that have said, hey, that is a problem. Let's solve that. And they solve it by adding another tool onto it. And it, it just fragments your work and it fragments your, your mental bandwidth. And now we see that happening with AI. Like you said, there is an AI plugged into every single one of these tools. So Notion has their own AI and ClickUp has their own AI. And um, what was the, the tool I was looking at? I was looking at a tool yesterday. Um, Canva. Canva has their own AI now that has yeah. limited capabilities. Let's just put it that yeah. way. You know, they're, the big thing they kind of launched with is, hey, you can use this Canva tool to make AI generated balloon text, like that kind of stuff. So like limited use cases, but all of them are being pitched as essentials and all of them are being pitched as some kind of level of magic. So if you're a developer, not only now do you have to worry about, all right, well, what, what tool am I looking at? Am I looking at Confluence or am I looking at Notion? Then you have to worry about where the AI is and what that AI is doing and how it's doing it. And will it be used correctly by the people in the company? Are you using it right? And then some AIs take instructions better than other, and, and so it's just this, this mountain of of shit, really, isn't it? Where you yeah. can no longer just focus on doing your work because you're so overwhelmed with all of these ongoing, increasing, piling decisions. Well, this has really been fun to get a, a look from your perspective as a as a writer and as a coder about how these tools are used and what their limitations are. I think just in conclusion, I'd say I'm as caught up in the excitement of all these tools as anyone else. And I find them all fascinating, you know, in their own kind of way because of the, you know, just the creativity that comes with them. Right. Um, but I, but I have to, but I think all of us have to be very focused on how we use the tools that we have and be very careful about how we use new tools because that is just, what is needed in, in my view at least in such a busy world that we're in i mean i mean i mean yeah i, I, I'm, I think on, I'm on twitter i don't even use twitter anymore i mean i barely use um um, um blue sky i mm. i started experimenting with threads because i just there's just too much yeah it's it's overwhelming it is a we are we are getting to a point of fragmentation where there are more options than ever, whether you're, you're talking about software tools or you're talking about text-based social media, there are so many different options. Part of me likes the fact that I, I do have options. The other part of me knows that the, the more fragmented we get, the less connected we get. So there are, you know, there are, right. there are trade-offs here and pros and cons. Right. Right. I think um, like if I was going to say anything positive about this whole, this whole topic, whether we're talking about fragmentation or AI or the, the combination of them, it's the, the best way forward is keeping a human in the mix and doing what you can personally to stay connected as a human, connected to your work, connected to the output that you have, not just trusting it to a machine, you know, not just trusting it to an algorithm, not just trusting it to a large language model. It is making sure that you are in there, in the mix, so that you are the stopgap. And I think that's very important because if we do reach, uh, I guess, a, um, a point where we are all happy to just go hands off and let the um, the LLMs do what they're going to do. I think that's that's the point where we all start to suffer. If we yeah. can all try to collectively keep that human in the in the mix, we're going to be happier with it. So yeah. Yeah, I guess don't don't reject AI outright. I think people often get the idea that I am rejecting AI because I I call it out a lot and I'm critical of it. But it's not necessarily that. It's that I'm critical of people who are intent on removing the humanity from the work that we do. I think that's so true. Well, thank you so much, John. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. It's been great talking. Appreciate it. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.